Hey y'all. Hello. Hello everyone. Hello. I'm having some camera issues, so I, this one seems to be working. So hopefully that stays working. Uh, but I'm probably further away than normal, and I don't think there's a way to fix that. Let's see here. Give me we'll we'll start in two, three minutes. Hey, Kenva. Hey, Precious. Good evening. Kenva, sorry about that earlier. It, uh, my video wasn't working, so I uh, stopped the meeting and started a new one. Oh, that's okay. Good evening, everyone. I was in the middle of emailing you to tell you that, that I got a new thing back up. Let's see here. Think. If I don't do this, then we're not going to record anything. Recordings. Yeah, I got to get rid of these. Y'all got quiet. What happened? <laughs> you are being recorded. Watch out. <laughs> All right, I think y'all can still hear me. Okay. Yes. Perfect. 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 All right. Well. Seven, eight. We have some stuff to get through today. We're gonna we're gonna scoot, maybe, hopefully. I say that, and you know, <laughs> we'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. Um, 
Good evening. How is everybody? Y'all good? Warm? Everybody warm? Good evening. Yeah. Yes. Kind of digging the, uh, I'm not digging the up and down, but the cool, cool felt good for me today. That was, that was good. That was good. All right. Well, um, why don't we pray and we'll get started. God, we're thankful for you today. And uh, we're thankful to have a, uh, a warm place to sit in right now. And uh, we're thankful for your word that we get to dive into. And I pray that, uh, that you would be honored through our study of it and that our lives would be better for it. Just help us to know you a little better when we finish than when we started. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, well, we left off in Exodus chapter 18, and we're going to get into 19 now. So we're, we're going to, uh, the Israelites are at Mount Sinai. Have come to the foot of the mountain. Moses, of course, has been there before, uh, way back when God revealed Himself to Moses. Uh, they were they were at this mountain, and God said, "Bring everybody back here." And so Moses has done that. God has led him back there by uh, probably a very different route than Moses and Aaron took uh, to to go to Egypt from there in the first place. So we, we pick up in 19, and there's about 600,000 men who are there, and there are, uh, that, that does not include women and children, we're told. So we've got a lot of people at the base of a mountain um, trying to think what, what city might be about, about that size. Uh, I don't know what's what's about a million plus people. San Antonio, Dallas, Dallas. What's what's Dallas Fort Worth is probably bigger than that, but San Antonio. So this is this is like San Antonio size group of people who have been traveling across the wilderness, and uh, I mean this is <laughs> this is a lot of people. Can you imagine? Um, can you imagine how uh, how amazing the food that they've been eating? every day was to have it just appear when you're in the middle of a desert um and uh it, it's it, it really is i think we said last time that them traveling this path it is nothing short of miraculous that they were actually able to survive with that many people crossing that amount of desert space away from away from the nile away from the fertile ground away from away from everything. I mean, this is all that sand. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, we'll, we'll talk about some of, uh, when we get to Leviticus, just, just some of the conditions that they dealt with and some of the, the specific laws that they have, how important some of those laws were for desert traveling people. Um, uh, we, we sort of miss, miss sometimes that, uh, that a lot of the specific laws that we find in Leviticus and Deuteronomy were given to a people who were traveling in the wilderness and how important some of those, some of those things would have been for them. Uh, and uh, I, I think that's going to be a really interesting thing to get to and talk about a little bit. But, um, but they've been traveling for a little while now, and they are at the foot of Mount Sinai uh, in chapter 19. And um, God calls Moses saying, you shall go to the house of Jacob and tell the people of Israel, chapter 19, verse four, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. How cool would it have been to have seen God work in those ways, in those miraculous ways with your own two eyes. You know, most, most of scripture 
is written for people who did not see with their own two eyes the things that God did uh, or see with their own two eyes the things that Jesus did. In fact, in John's gospel, he's, he's, he, he wrote, he was the latest gospel writer out of everyone. John saw Jesus with his own two eyes, but he's writing to a group of people who are having kind of a faith crisis, a group of people who most of them did not see Jesus with their own two eyes, and they're simply relying on the testimony of other people about Jesus. Um, and so, so most of Scripture uh, is written about people who saw and experienced God and Jesus with their own two eyes, or, or if we're Thomas who stuck our fingers in the holes, and, uh, and so, but, but it's written for a people uh, who, who didn't see all of this with their own two eyes. In fact, when you get to the next generation uh, of people in the Exodus, they didn't see God work all the wonders that, that this generation did. They're simply um, continuing to go on based on the stories that, that their parents had told them, if their parents managed to tell them those stories. I think that's one, we, we're not going to get to it, but at the beginning of Joshua, they cross the Red Sea again, and he parts, he parts the sea, he parts the Jordan River for them, and they walk across when it's at flood stage. And I, I think a lot of that is because they hadn't seen God work the miracles that he did, and God wanted them to see and to trust and to have faith as they're entering the promised land. Um, but uh, but they, they saw, God says. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be a, my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests, and a holy nation. Now, that's an interesting phrase because it's repeated in the New Testament, 1 Peter chapter 2, and I should have had this marked already. We'll see how quick I can find it. 1 Peter chapter 2. Uh, verse 9, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, Peter says to Christians. So he's he probably has in mind this verse from, from Exodus when, um, when God calls the Israelites a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Now, Israel has priests from the tribe of whom? <coughs> the Levites, right? From the tribe of Levi. The Levites are, are priests. Uh, but, but here he says, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests. Not just, not just a tribe of priests, but a kingdom of priests, which makes it sound like he says this entire nation is meant to be a kingdom of priests, which is very interesting to me. What, what is the job of a priest? What, what, what does a priest, priest's job boil down to? Oh, yeah, there you go. To, a, a priest mediates between people and God, um, which sort of falls in line with the promise that God made to Abraham way back at Genesis, when he said, you, the, the whole world will be blessed through you. If Israel is to be a kingdom of priests, if they're supposed to mediate between, between God and people, then, then they've got a pretty profound job, don't they? It's a profound job. It's not just about Israel. It's about other nations who they come in contact with. And Later on, you, you're going to see the Israelites indicted because they failed to be a kingdom of priests. Uh, Isaiah says it a different way. Several times he says, you were supposed to be a light to the nations, which what he means by that is the other nations were supposed to see what it looks like to be a nation who's in a relationship with God. And, and you were supposed to show them that and how wonderful and amazing it is, and you failed miserably at it, Isaiah says. Um, and I, I think that's part of the idea here when, when they're called a 
kingdom of priests, a holy nation. They're, they're a group of people who are set aside to show the world what it looks like to be in a relationship with God, uh, which, which I think is something that, that we can take away from that as well, because we're called the same. We're called a royal priesthood by Peter. Christians are. Uh, and part of, part of doing life as a follower of Jesus is that, that we show the rest of the world what it looks like to be in a wonderful, amazing relationship with God. Uh, and we're, we're called to that. We're called to be that. I heard somebody say that, I think I said this before, but, but you might be the only Bible that some people ever read. The only Bible that some people ever read. And uh, that's, a, that's a very high calling. And I wonder, I wonder if Israel really understood how high of a calling that was here and how much of an honor it was to be able to represent God to, to the rest of the world. I mean, what an honor that God would choose them to, to do that. Um, eventually, you sort of see that they misunderstood it. They misunderstood it, and they said, ah, we're this holy nation that's set apart. We're God's people, and nobody else can have anything to do with them. And that wasn't really God's intent there. His intent was that they would be a kingdom of priests and that they would bring people to him as opposed to repelling people. Food for thought. Um, so Moses calls the elders of the people. He, he sets all these words before them, and they, they agree to, uh, to the things that, that God is asking them to agree to. And the Lord said to Moses, verse 9, Behold, I am coming to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you and may also believe you forever. And so uh, we come down. And Moses comes down from the mountain. He gives some instructions about how to be ready for God to show up. He says, don't, you, they don't want to get too close because they're going to burn up. <laughs> they're going to burn up if they get too close to God. And uh, as the sound of a trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke. God answered him, verse 19, in thunder, the Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of mount, the mountain, and Moses went up. And, and it's probably this incredible sight. And so Moses goes up the mountain, and this is where we get the Ten Commandments. Um, how do the Ten Commandments begin? They go up, they go up to the mountain. And then, and then what happens? He goes up. Yes. So in between there, God gives some commandments, right? What, how, how do they start? When God first starts speaking, how, how do the Ten Commandments begin? Ah. Okay. So normally, if you ask people, how do the Ten Commandments begin? They're going to start with, you shall have no other gods before me. Or if you're like our kids here, they say, one God, no idols, respect God. So, so we go through the Ten Commandments, right? Um, but here's, here's the interesting thing to me. Um, the Ten Commandments begin like this. Chapter 20, verse 2, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. So... Um, there, there's, a, there's a group of people who see a different God in the Old Testament than the God in the New Testament, like God somehow changed in between the Old Testament or the New Testament or changed how he did things. This was, um, this was a, a pretty big belief. It's still a belief today. Um, and it's, and, and if, you, if you read the right parts of the New Testament and the, the right parts of the Old Testament, you can make a case that it seems like God is very, very different. Um, the, uh, often you hear something like, well, the God of the Old Testament was all about judgment. It was all about justice and judgment. And the God of the New Testament is all about grace and mercy. Uh, may, maybe, maybe this is new for you, uh, but 
but there's there are people who think like that and and maybe maybe some of us have thought like that before too because sometimes you read the old testament and you think what in the world is going on what, what's going on um but but here's here's what i want to say here before god ever gave a list of rules before god ever gave the ten commandments he said i am your god to the people to whom he gave the commandments to. He said, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. He, he freed them from slavery. He kept them alive in the desert. He led them by a cloud and a pillar of fire. He split the Red Sea for them and swallowed up Egypt and their chariots and their armies. Uh, he, he gave them water when they had none. He gave them manna and quail and fed them and brought them to the base of the mountain and uh, offered the opportunity to be his, his holy, special people before he ever gave them the Ten Commandments. Uh, and I want to differentiate here because I think it's an important distinction and I think the Israelites messed it up eventually. Uh, but this distinction is, is that you don't, you, you, didn't, you didn't become a part of God's people by following the Ten Commandments. You were already made a part of God's people. And once you became a part of God's people, you agreed to do your best to honor them. And follow them. And that's a very important distinction. God took a whole bunch of people who were, I mean, let's be honest, a whole bunch of knuckleheads, just like me and just like anybody else. They're just a bunch of knuckleheads um, who who didn't have it all together. Who had who really were were syncretists, which which means that they had combined a whole bunch of different religions into one, and they're still sorting that out here as we're as we'll see. Hopefully today we can move that far, <laughs> but. Um, but, but they don't have it all figured out, and they're going to mess up. And um, God's going to extend grace and mercy in the Old Testament when they didn't deserve it. After he's given them explicit and strike right after he's given them explicit instructions. And he's basically right in front of them, uh, and they're seeing with their own two eyes the power of God. You would think, hey, power of God, right in front of me, so I'm going to keep my act together. Well, they didn't. And, I, and we, we think maybe if we were sitting in front of God that, and could see his power being displayed in front of us over and over and over again, that, that we'd get it together pretty quick. But I think the reality is that we're probably not much different than the people here. Um, hence Jesus. Hence Jesus. Uh, but, but the distinction that, that the commandments were given to people who, who God already called his own. They, they weren't, it wasn't, okay, you have followed these 10 commandments for 10 years, and so now you get to be a part of my people. Yes, Kimba. Um, did you say syncrotist? Like syncrotist, yes. S-Y-C-R-E-N-T. I S T syncretist. Thank you. You're welcome. And that is, that is someone who has taken uh, two different religions or systems of belief and combined them into one um, common, common day example uh, would be maybe um, help me out. New Orleans, um, voodoo, 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 voodoo takes several, there, there's, there are aspects of Christianity that are involved in voodoo, but it's, but it's a combination of lots of different religions. It's, it's a syncretist religion. Um, so yeah, syncretist or syncretism would be uh, the broader term and a syncretist is someone who practices syncretism yeah um 
so so yeah, here here we have these these commandments, and uh, let's let's just read through these because I, I think they I think they tell you a lot about who God is, and I, I think um, Kaylee, you actually wrote a little bit about this, and I, I, I really appreciated your point because I was going here also. Um, but this this idea that all of the other rules and laws that you see that we're going to go through in Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy uh, are, are basically these Ten Commandments, what these Ten Commandments look like lived out in their particular time and place. Uh, some of those things that we're going to read in Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, they don't apply to us whatsoever, but but they flow from, from these 10 as, as kind of the, the big 10. And the, uh, these still apply, but they might be applied somewhat differently today than they would have been uh, for the Israelites wandering through the desert. So here we go. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Um, uh, you know, right? <laughs> they do. I love carved stuff. Yeah. Yeah. If you can remove the, the um, religious aspect from it. Yeah. It's an interesting, it's an interesting thing. Yeah. <laughs> it, Paul sort of deals with that a little bit in the New Testament, not totem poles in, in particular, but just this, this idea of, uh, I mean, I, eating idol meat that was sacrificed to idols, right? Can, can you do it? And Paul sort of deals with that, with that question a little bit because um, it's kind of said, you know, idols, they don't really have any power. They're, they're nothing. Um, but yeah, it's, it's an, interesting, an interesting question. Uh-oh, my battery is running low. Apparently I did not plug in. Excuse me. <laughs> about now. Ha <laughs> ha. Better. Okay. The NLT says it, where it says, you must not bow down to them, your idols, mm -hmm. or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate respection for other gods. Mm -hmm. He will not tolerate, which is that in verse five yeah no it's nlt uh yeah but that was that was verse five that you were reading you shall not bow down to them or serve them yeah yeah i'm trying to think what what he uses here uh, visit iniquity yeah it's a it's kind of a different <laughs> different different wording there yeah tolerate sort of uh it seems to kind of take take a little bit of the harshness out of it a little bit, and I, um, you'll you'll find that the New Living does that sometimes. Um, the people who translated the New Living translation, it's it's a little bit more of a paraphrase and trying to go after the intent as opposed to the to the actual words. And sometimes when you do that, it softens the blow a little bit. Well, not necessarily. Uh, I mean, it, it depends on what what God actually intended there. Um, but uh, but a more uh, a more literal type translation will um, sort of let you make up your own mind right. about it. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's not it's not wrong. It's just um, people trying to understand what is what is meant there. Um, let's see. Uh, note that he says, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. I think that's an interesting phrase. Uh, I think it was, somebody said, 
something about this that was just a scathing remark. I think it was Oprah. I think Oprah said something about, about how, how, can, how can any kind of a good God be jealous? Something along those lines. Forgive me for not knowing the, the exact quote. Uh, but um, I, I don't know. Like I, can, I can kind of understand this. If you're in a married relationship and your spouse is, is showing a lot of interest in somebody else besides you, then, well... I mean, you, we, we can understand this, I think. We can understand this. God wants them to be, he, he wants to be their one and only. And, and when you watch what happens with, with nations of people who, with people who worship lots of God, like it's, it, yeah, I mean, you can kind of see why when you watch what happens. Um, when people don't do that. Let's see, verse 7, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. His name is serious. And part, part, of, part of Exodus is that he wants his name to be known. And he wants himself to be known through his name. And uh, he doesn't want to be misrepresented which is why, why people eventually just said, eh, I'm, we're just not ever going to say his name out loud because we're so scared of what might happen if we do this poorly, which isn't necessarily the best reaction, maybe. Um, but uh, verse 8, remember the Sabbath day. We'll talk about this a, a little bit later to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. Uh, I will say... There is um, among present day Christianity, there is there, there are a lot of books that are being written about taking taking a Sabbath and the different ways that you can do that. Um, and it's not uh, not a it's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. Don't don't hear me saying that. But the emphasis is always on the day of rest. But but do note that they are asked and told to do labor for six days. We sort of leave that part out, but that's part of the commandment. Part of the Sabbath day commandment is that you work for six and you rest for one. You work for six and you rest for one. Uh, on it, you shall, the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it, you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gate. So this applies to everybody, everybody and everything. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy, set it apart for something special. Uh, honor your father and mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God has given you. Interesting that those two things are, are connected. Um, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, and you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. Uh, so uh, Jesus, yeah. Mm -hmm. What does that actually mean? You shall bear false witness against your neighbor. It's a very good question. <laughs> it's a very good question because it doesn't say don't tell a white lie. It says do not do not bear false witness against your neighbor. And obviously, um, at the beginning of this saga, two people were were uh, uh, honored by God for lying to protect the lives of babies. Um, and later on in this story, uh, Rahab is going to be commended for, for lying and being a woman of faith because she lied in order to, again, save people, to value life. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, it's debated. It's debated what it actually means. Some, some even go as far to say that uh, this is like a courtroom term and that it's it's a, a legal thing and 
you're if you're in court or you're brought before the judge, then then you don't you don't uh, give false testimony in in that um, in that scenario. I, I think it's broader than that. I don't think it's simply a legal thing, uh, but yeah, obviously there's a value in truth telling that's being put forth here. So. Um, yeah, so it's it's debated. Indeed. Yeah. Sabbath. Is it is it okay to any date of the week to rest? Or must it be a particular day? And if it must be a particular day, what day should it be? Say say it one more time. Can I just choose a day to rest and call oh. it Sabbath? Or how? How do we observe the Sabbath? That's a that's a very good question. Um so they they were were required to do it on the uh, seventh day. So Saturday was their Sabbath, um, and if you're if you were a Jew today, then you would still be required to do it on on Saturday. There, that's what that's what their the rabbis all teach and say, and that's 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 your Sabbath day. Um, so. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a very good question. It's a very good question. Um, the uh, you know it, it, in Acts, Christians sort of did Saturday as a Sabbath, but then they started meeting on on Sundays on the first day of the week to coincide with the resurrection of. Of Jesus um, and to distinguish themselves from Judaism a little bit, because in the in the Roman world, Christians and Jews were just seen as uh, two different sects of the same group of people, the same religion, uh, and so Christians wanted to to be different and they wanted to celebrate on on the day. So. Scripturally, biblically, we read in Acts that they that that's why they started meeting on on Sundays on the first day of the week instead of uh, just celebrating the Sabbath, like like Jews did. Um, but functionally, it also served to help separate them from from Judaism just a just a little bit. So yeah, it's a it's a really good question. Um, I would I would venture to say that most most Christians do not really celebrate the Sabbath. Um, some, some do, but, but I would venture to say that most probably, probably do not, especially not, not exactly like it's, it's talked about here, at least. Because um, on our, our worship days, we, we still do a little bit of work most of the time. Um, so, yeah, we cook and we... And we, yeah, yeah, clean our house. It's part of our weekend, and we do we do weekend stuff after after service. So, so yeah, it's a that's a really really good question. I'm I don't have an answer <laughs> for it. A lot of people do it very differently. Okay, thank you. Yes. Uh, so Jesus, he he was asked if you remember. Um, what was the greatest out of all the commandments? You remember how he answered? How do you answer? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. Not necessarily in that order. Um, and that was one. Love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah, which are both uh, Old Testament quotes, actually. Um, Deuteronomy 6.5 is where love the Lord your God comes from, uh, except there's, uh, it doesn't include strength. And Leviticus 19.18 is where love your neighbor as yourself comes from. Um, but uh, he, he, he finished that by saying, in these two commandments, all the law and the prophets uh, rest in these two commandments. So 
So these Ten Commandments, Jesus said, um, fall in these two categories, loving God and loving people, basically. So uh, kind of the way that we, that we talk about this is that the first, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four have to do with, with this vertical relationship between people and God, and the last six have to do with this horizontal relationship between people. So verse four, love God, uh, and the last six, love people. Um, so that's how Jesus summed these up even more concisely. Uh, let's see, verse 18. All the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. The people were afraid and trembled. They stood far off and said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but don't let God speak to us or we might die. Moses said to the people, do not fear, for God has come to test you that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. I think that's, I think that's a good point. The, the people said, "Listen, we don't. <laughs> you you be our go-between. That's cool. This is close enough for us." Which I think is probably a pretty common reaction for people who, who lay eyes on God. If you think about Isaiah, who who saw a vision of God seated on a throne, and he immediately falls down on his knees and buries his face and says, "Woe is me! My eyes have seen." God. And I mean, he's, he's, he's stricken simply by the side of God. Here, people aren't even seeing God. They're just seeing the, the results of him coming down to earth to meet with, with Moses. Uh, term for that is theophany, T-H-E-O-P-H-A-N-Y, theophany. That's when um, God comes to earth and reveals himself in a particular way. It's a revealing of God in some way, shape, or form. Usually in scripture when there is a theophany, of which there are not very many, um, uh, you're going to see nature react kind of like this. There's thunder, there's lightning, there's earthquaking, there's, there's all sorts of crazy things that nature does when, when God comes down. Um, so uh, let's see. So Moses says that he's done this so that they may not sin. And I, I think that's, I think that's a, a good point for us. Um, how, don't, don't raise your hand, but how, how many of us typically maybe go five or six miles an hour over the speed limit when we drive? <laughs> or raise your hand. It's okay. Uh, no judgment here. Um, but uh, what do you do if you're going five or six miles an hour over the speed limit, and then all of a sudden you look up and realize that you're about to pass a police car? You slow down and you start going the speed limit. There is something to be said for um, the powers that be being in front of you and being reminded of the powers that be. Um, uh, so Moses says, listen, this is good. This is good that you're seeing this, even though you're really, really scared right now, because maybe it will keep you from sin. Maybe it will keep you from sin. It will keep you from bad things. Um, there is there's something not necessarily bad about being, being observed at times. It changes, it changes our behavior. It does. Um, so then, then we're going to have some laws that are given. And I, my, my contention is that, uh, that the laws that, that are here now are some of the ways that the Ten Commandments, uh, these things that are near and dear to God's heart, uh, how, how they play out in the world of the Israelites. Um, 
I mean, you, you read chapter 21, and my, my subheading says, laws about slaves. It's not really something necessarily that applies to us in particular, because um, slavery, as, as you think about it, um, is not what it was 150 years ago. I'm treading lightly here because uh, obviously there are still incredibly tragic situations in our city, in our state, in our country, and in our world. Um, so uh, slavery obviously still exists in some ways and forms. Uh, but um, this is this is the world that that God has uh, come into with His people, and I what I, what I want you to to see when you read through that is um, uh, Scripture does not condone slavery as as we think of slavery. Um, what this is talking about is more. Uh, you you might think of it under the term indentured servitude um like like if uh, someone is incapable of uh they just have bad luck after bad luck after bad luck they're down on their luck they have absolutely nothing and so they go and they become an indentured servant of uh of someone who can use them and that someone then um, provides their meals and provides a place for them to stay and they work. And um, that's, that's more, uh, and, and they're, they're slaves in the technical sense that they are part of that family. And uh, so it's, it's, it's a little different than, than how we would think about slavery, I think. But, um, but I think if you read through there, you'll you'll see how different it is, um, and and even even with this, like uh, uh, just in the the first little part here. Um, let's see. So slaves are to be freed. He'll, he'll serve for for six years, and on the seventh year, he shall be set free for nothing. So, so it is a uh, short-term deal. Uh, and um, if the slave plainly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out for free, then his master shall bring him to God, and he shall bring him to the door or the doorpost, and his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall be his slave forever. So he pierces his ear, basically. That's kind of kind of the idea, and there's there's kind of a little ceremony that goes along with it. And so, um, it's a sign that that person loves their their master, and they want to be a part of their family and stay with them. Oh. Yeah, and I mean, as as a slave, but 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 we in a different way than we think of slavery in a, in a different way. Yeah. I mean, what, but yeah, yeah. Much, much more like, like they're part of the family, uh, I think is kind of the idea here. Um, yeah. 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 Yeah, I mean, what what person would want to go and put themselves back underneath somebody else who treated them like dirt all the time? I mean, nobody would do that. So, so this is considering a, a situation where um, there's a there's a loving, caring person who who has basically sort of made you a part of their family, and they you know they take care of you. So, so like yeah, yeah, I, and I think that's more what's what's described here is more of an indentured servitude kind of thing or or um something along those lines as as opposed to um uh 
more what we would normally think of when we when we hear the word slave. So, um, but uh, good to read. So there's there's all kinds of laws in here. Um, laws about restitution, like if if something happens to one of your animals or to one of your to to something that you that you own, the things that you've got to do for somebody. Got all kinds of, of uh, social justice type laws, um, just justice between people. Um, uh, I think, uh, I think, verses twenty one through twenty four are interesting. You shall not wrong a sojourner or oppress him, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. Uh, I'll, I'll, you're going to see that more than once. Um, uh, don't do this because remember when you were in that situation, uh, he, their, God is, is creating some empathy here. Uh, hey, you were in that situation. Don't treat somebody else like that who's in your situation. Do them better than was done to you. Uh, and then if you do mistreat them, oh, you shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. If you do mistreat them and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry. My wrath will burn and I will kill you with the sword and your wives shall become widows and your children fatherless. So as you do to those, it will happen to you kind of thing. Um, and again, at the end of verse 27, uh, if he cries to me, I will hear for I am compassionate which is kind of a, an empathetic kind of word. Um, so uh, you, you hear that more than once too, that God will hear the cries of those who, um, who are oppressed in some way, shape, or form. Um, there's, there's little things like, uh, you shall be consecrated to me, therefore you shall not eat any flesh that is torn by beasts in the field, you shall throw it to the dogs. Why don't you eat the flesh of an animal that has already been eaten on by another animal? Do what? It's it's bad meat. Yeah, it's going to hurt you. It's got bacteria in it, um, which we'll, we'll come back to at another point. But just, just to say it briefly here, um, this, is, this is like 4,000 years ago. And here's, here's a God who recognizes in, in this scripture that is written, who knows how long ago, um, that there's something not good about eating an animal that's been eaten on by another animal because it's going to hurt you. It's interesting that we find it there um, many, many, many years ago. When we were just figuring out bacteria, we're still figuring out bacteria, still, still. And yet here we find it in Exodus. Uh, shall not fall, verse chapter 23, verse two, you shall not fall in with the many. To, you shall not fall in with the many to do evil, nor shall you bear witness in a lawsuit siding with the many so as to pervert justice. So just because there's a larger group of people over here saying, let's do this, doesn't mean that you just hop in with the, with the big group of people. There's just there's some interesting laws in here, I think. Um, Nor shall you be partial to a poor man in his lawsuit. I think that's interesting. Um, you shall not be partial to someone because they don't have as much as someone else. It's interesting. If you see the donkey of one who hates you lying down under its burden, you shall refrain from leaving him with it, and you shall rescue it with him. This is kind of a uh, Old Testament version of love your enemy, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, so, you see somebody who hates you, and they're, they're donkeys on top of them, Yeah. <laughs> uh, love your enemy. 
And again, in verse nine, you shall not oppress a sojourner. You know the heart of a sojourner for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. This happened to you. Do better than those who did it to you. Um, let's see, end of 23, they're about to go into lands of people who worship all kinds of other gods. You shall make no covenant with them and their gods. They shall not dwell in your land, lest they make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. Remember that. It's a little bit of foreshadowing. Um, God says, don't do it. And so, of course, they did what? They did it. Yeah. They get, they get stuck in, uh, they, well, num numbers is, it, when we get to Balaam and his donkey, just... <laughs> Uh, this is what they, they got, it became a snare to them, it became a snare. Um, let's see, so chapter 24, there's this covenant and it's confirmed in this little cere ceremony. Um, Moses, verse 15, went up on the mountain, the cloud covered the mountain and the glory of the Lord dwelt on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it six days. So I like this word glory. Um, because I get to tell fun stories when I talk about glory. But um, uh, so glory is, it's, it's an interesting word, um, but there's, there's a lot of meaning packed into it. So uh, it has this sense of something that, that was hidden that's now being revealed, uh, something that was unknown being made known, something that was in the darkness being brought out into the light. Right. So um, my son, when he was very, very, very little, when he was like, you know, two years old or something, um, he absolutely loved, like any most children, loved to just be naked and run around naked all over the place. And um, so we, we used to have interns that would stay with us every summer in the house. And so we... Um, we always kept girl interns because my wife would be home during the day. And, and anyways, so, um, so he would take a shower and before we could get him a towel wrapped around him, he'd be off. And there's these, there's these, all, all these interns in our living room. And my son is just streaking in front of all of them and having a blast until we finally catch him. Um, and, but, but if you were, if you were one of those interns who saw him, they might've said something like, there he is in all of his glory. That which was hidden has been brought out into the open. That which was unknown has been made known. That which was in the darkness has been brought out into the light. Um, so when you, when you see the word glory, what's being said is that God is revealing himself in some very special way. Uh, when we talk about glory in the New Testament, it's a very similar kind of thing, um, but it denotes the, the presence of God in, in, a, in some way, shape, or form in Him revealing Himself in a special way. Um, so when we, when we as a people bring glory to God, what we are doing, uh, in essence, is revealing Him to those around us. Does that make sense? I like the word glory. Um, let's see, verse 20, chapter 25, we, we're starting in on um, the Ark of the Covenant and the table for the bread and the tabernacle and the golden lampstand and the altar and uh, all, these, all these different sorts of things. Um, do take note that um, the, the, with the Ark of the Covenant, there's a mercy seat that sits on top of it. And this is where God meets his people. This is where God meets the priest. It is at this, at this mercy seat with the two cherubim uh, covering over it as if um, protecting the glory or the revealing of God. And you'll, you'll, see, um, you'll see these cherubim show up in uh, Ezekiel. You'll see them in... Revelation. You'll, you'll see them in places, and every time you see the cherubim, uh, 
they are protecting the presence of God. So in Ezekiel, when God's coming down on a chariot, the idea is that God is coming down to be among his people again. Uh, and there's cherubim at each corner. They are protecting the presence. Of, that's what they do is they protect the presence of God. They, uh, when the glory of God is somewhere, when God is revealing himself somewhere, the cherubim are, are always there. So it's kind of a kind of a special thing, and it looks back to to this here because the cherubim uh, protect the mercy seat where God comes and meets His people. Um, I, in the Dropbox folder, I've put several different things that have like drawings of the tabernacle and some descriptions of the lampstand and some of these different things that are going to be in inside the tabernacle. There's uh, a picture of. Uh, drawn of what a, a priest's garment might have looked like um, and uh, all sorts of, of different things. The, the priests, chapter 29, they have to go through a whole lot of stuff in order to be able to, to practice as a priest. Uh, they have to be consecrated. They have to be um, cleaned by uh, uh, a whole, whole slew of things. Um, there is, in chapter 30, there's a, a census tax. So there's, um, uh, you, you see taxes here starting to take shape in, in the New Testament. So there's a census that's going to be done, and there's going to be taxes that are, that are taken up. They're, they're starting to sound like a nation, not just a scattered group of people, but they're starting to sound more like a nation. That's kind of what a nation does, isn't it? It, it, um, it figures out who its people are. And, it, uh, and then those people uh, help make it run with the taxes that they pay. Um, so you, you start to, now this is more of a uh, uh, tax that's given, let's see, uh, atonement money from the people of Israel and shall give it for the service of the tent of meeting that it may bring the people of Israel to remembrance before the God, before the Lord, so as to make atonement for your lives. Chapter 30, verse 16. So um, it's a, a little different than how we think of taxes, probably. But, um, but everyone is taxed exactly the same, uh, regardless of how much they have, interestingly. Um, but uh, uh, so there's, there's this census tax. Uh, chapter 31 We've got Oholiab and Bezalel. Uh, and that, this, is, this is interesting to me. The Lord said to Moses, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God. Did you know that God did that in the Old Testament too? I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship to devise artistic designs, to work in gold, silver, and bronze, and cutting stones for setting and in carving wood, to work in every craft. It's very interesting. Uh, I've been teaching 1 Corinthians uh, on Sunday mornings. And uh, one of the big problems in 1 Corinthians are Christians who have been given spiritual gifts, um, gifts that come from having the Spirit of God in them. And Paul is very, 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 very careful to refer to them as gifts, not as talents that people developed on their own, but as gifts, because everybody's arguing and fighting about whose gift is the best. Um, but, uh, but isn't it, there, there's three main lists of spiritual gifts that are listed in the New Testament. You find one in Romans, you find one in 1 Corinthians, and the other is, forgive me, I should have written it down. That's what happens when I don't write stuff down. Um, but, uh, but, not in any of those lists are this idea of someone um, being gifted with 
the ability to devise artistic designs to work in gold, silver, and bronze and cutting stones for setting and in carving wood to work in every craft. You ever thought of that as a, as a spiritual gift? Uh, kind of what it looks like here. It's, it is something that was given to them by the Spirit, by being filled with the Spirit of God. Um, so food for thought there. It's interesting. Um, we come to the Sabbath again. Uh, I'm going to talk about that again later. I don't have time to do it justice here. Um, and chapter 32, Moses delayed coming down from the mountain. People gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make his gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Okay, there's, there's like a whole slew of problems right there. Um, one, the Israelites were just told, you shall make no, <laughs> no images, right? No idols. Uh, you shall have no other gods before me. There, there's, so that's, we, we've got some issues there. Um, Moses had just said, hey, you see all this stuff right here is right in front of you so that you, it'll help you not to sin because you can see the power of God. They're looking at it. And they're still uh, wanting to make gods. Uh, also, note that they said, Moses brought us up out of the land of Egypt. Isn't that interesting? Because who really brought them out of Egypt? God did. And yet here's Moses, and he's been gone for a little bit. And they start to worry a little bit because Moses has been gone for a little bit. This doesn't bode very well for them when Moses eventually dies, does it? Um, but, uh, but yeah, they're, they're struggling because Moses is not right in front of them anymore. Uh, and I, I think this goes back a little bit to, to when uh, Moses was saying, no, 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 I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't talk. I don't speak good. I can't do this. I can't do that. No, it's going to be too hard. I'm not capable of doing this. And God finally says, okay, all right, you you can have Aaron talk for you. I'll speak to you. You speak to Aaron. Aaron speak to everybody on your behalf. It, it, but he said, it will be like as you are God. And that's sort of what's happened here. He's gone. Moses is gone. And even in the presence of this cloud and thunder and lightning and all this stuff on the mountain, um, the people are very quick to say, ah, we need some gods. So they gather up a whole bunch of gold, they melt it down, and Aaron, the priest, goes along with it, um, and, and they make a, a young bull, or they make a golden calf, not a bull, it's a calf, um, which was an Egyptian god. So here you see their syncretism coming out a little bit. They're, they're having trouble distinguishing between the gods of Egypt and Yahweh, a god. Uh, they've been doing it for so long. They've been steeped in something for so, so, so long. And, and this, is, this is a journey for them uh, in so many ways. It's a big journey. Um, they made Moses the God because you know they see it from Job's point of view, but not God's point of view. And they don't realize that God's working through them to learn from them, or they don't see Moses, you know, or they don't see him, they start doubting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's I think that's what what's kind of being said here. Um, Moses is the one who brought us out of the land of Egypt. And he's not here anymore. So we're going to have to figure something else out. Yeah. Yeah, I think they, they saw him as God, even though he, he told them all the time that he was not. Or, well, 
maybe Aaron told them all the time because he wasn't willing to speak on his own. Um, we are about out of time. So we're going to stop right there and we'll pick back up with that. And uh, we will finish up Exodus and we'll get into Levit 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 Leviticus next week. Any questions about anything? <coughs> Okay, we are done. I guess let's, let's pray and we'll be done. God, we're thankful for you. God, I know it's, uh, it's difficult for some of us to be here and be a part of this this evening because we've got so much, many other things going on. I know that uh, several of us have, have things that are going on and uh, different situations and different health things and just, uh, just all kinds of stuff. I pray that you would be with each and every one of us and uh, that you'd walk with us this week. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank Have you a good night. Y'all too. Thank you. Thanks.